This special series is brought to the public by Amin Ra University. This audio presentation is read and voiced by Shakim Ra. It is originally written by Bridger J. Gillings. Mathematics in the Time of the Pharaohs Introduction 1. Of the oddest of all the phenomena which come to the attention of students of the history of mathematics is that logarithms were invented by Napier more than a decade before Descartes first conceived the idea of using indices in algebra. This oddity becomes even more striking when we observe that mathematical textbooks today introduce the subject of logarithms by a preliminary study of the index laws of algebra, which is a pedagogically perhaps the very best way to do it. Chronologically, therefore, the expected order of invention seems to have been reversed Things are the wrong way round. A second oddity of the history of mathematics was brought to light when the Babylonian clay tablet Plimpton 322 was translated by Nugu Bar and Sox in 1945. The translation established beyond any doubt that the Pythagorean theorem was well known to Babylonian mathematicians more than a thousand years before Pythagoras was born. The history books tell us that the Greek mathematicians sacrificed an ox to celebrate the discovery of the theorem named after him. Here then is an unrewarded anticipation for doubtless the name of the famous theorem will remain as a true optimist the Pythagorean Theorem for all time. Now, there is a third oddity in the history of mathematics, which however, we can clearly understand and explain. It is indeed one of the raisons d'artre for this book. It is the circumstance that the mathematics, astronomy, and science of the two most ancient of our recorded civilizations the Egyptian and the Babylonian have only recently been the subjects of historical research. And the very simple reason for that is that for nearly 3,000 years, no one knew what the many extant hieroglyphic and cuneiform writings of these two civilizations meant, nor indeed whether they were writing at all. It was not until Champollion's Dictionnaire Egyptien appeared in 1842 that the Egyptian hieroglyphs were at last deciphered and not until the latter part of the 19th century that the cuneiform writings, beginning in 1802, with their many languages were deciphered by Assyriologists and the secrets so well hidden for centuries indeed for millennia at last unfolded. As a result of these pioneering researches, scholars are now at work in universities, institutes, and museums, transcribing and translating inscriptions from temples and tombs, writings on clay tablets, and stele, hieratic, and demotic writings on papyri and ostraca, which had lain unread for years as interesting objects and relics of past civilizations, ancient records whose meaning and significance were only to be guessed or wondered at. Today, scientific and historical journals throughout the world are receiving valuable and informative articles on Egypt and Babylonia to such an extent 
they can scarcely cope with the material. What we today call science and mathematics must have played an important role in the achievement of all of this. I am reminded of a piece of wisdom attributed to Arnold Buffum Chase, the principal author of the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus. I venture to suggest that if one were to ask for that single attribute of the human intellect which would most clearly indicate the degree of civilization of a race, the answer would be the power of close reasoning and that this power could best be determined in a general way by the mathematical skill which members of the race displayed. Judged by this standard, the Egyptians of the 19th century before Christ had a high degree of civilization. If we accept this thought as one containing a solid measure of truth, then it will surely come as a great surprise to the readers of this history to find that whatever great heights the ancient Egyptians may have achieved, scientifically, their mathematics was based on two very elementary concepts. The first was their complete knowledge of the twice times table, and the second, their ability to find two-thirds of any number, whether integral or fractional. Upon these two very simple foundations, the whole structure of Egyptian mathematics was constructed and erected, as we shall see. No Egyptian scribe could have ever claimed to be the first man to pick up a mallet and chisel and to have said to himself, Now, I am going to invent hieroglyphics. He could never have set about carving on a block of stone various figures that would have a special meaning or would convey a message to those who might see it. Neither could it have happened that some intelligent scribe could have been the very first to think of slicing up some Nile River papyrus reeds, and by placing some strips crosswise over others and pressing them flat, invented paper. Then, bruising the end of a smaller reed and having dipped it into a pot of ink, made the dramatic announcement, Now I'm going to write in hieratic characters. Neither of these things could have happened like that the invention of hieroglyphics, which must have come first, took many, many years, perhaps centuries. And hieratic writing, the first cursive form of hieroglyphics, developed much later as a quicker and more convenient way of recording an agreement, conveying a message, or making a calculation with numbers than by the detailed drawing of pictographic hieroglyphs. No one is able to say exactly when writing as we understand it actually began. But with the Egyptians, as with other ancient civilizations, often the hieroglyphic and hieratic writing is written vertically downwards, but still also from right to left. In hieroglyphic and hieratic writing, the various birds, reptiles, snakes, and other animals, the scribes, seated or erect, and the human faces all face the direction from which the writing is coming when drawn, as most of them are, in profile. The student of Egyptian and Babylonian mathematics is seldom a competent Egyptologist or a seriologist as well as being a mathematician. So for translations, he is dependent on the skilled specialist in hieratic, demotic, or cuneiform writing. A 
Among such specialists are to be found those who are most competent in some particular branch of the language, as, for example, Middle Kingdom Hieratic or Ptolemaic Demotic, as on the Rosetta Stone, or the Cuneiform Script, Sumerian, Babylonian, or Akkadian. But there is one powerful factor that is used to advantage by the historian of mathematics. It is that the number systems can all be read and translated by him, even if he cannot understand the words with which the numbers are associated. Indeed, he can go a little further. He can, with a little industry, learn some of the standard symbols commonly associated with mathematical situations, that is, recurrent phrases and specific expressions that will help in assessing an interpretation provided by the translator who may not himself be competent in the mathematician's own field.